Welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio host, and nationally recognized safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Join us each week as we discuss the best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. Follow Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe. All right, Doc. First, I want to say thanks for allowing me to do this for you. Um, you know, we've had our relationship over the past, what, year and a half or so, almost two years. Yeah. And uh, you've supported, uh, you know, the podcast ventures that I've done. And I truly do enjoy your show as well. And so I really wanted to do something to give back to that. And uh, this is allowing me the opportunity to do that. So I, I appreciate it. And Hector, I appreciate uh, that. You're assembling this show and just uh, you've helped me in the podcast community back when I was struggling with recording interviews literally on my phone uh, to help me with understanding the technology. And, and uh, I'm at 102 episodes. so I wouldn't be there without you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. All right. So let's um, you know, you gave me a preview of the book and I thought it was an amazing book. And what I would really like the audience to know is kind of how did you choose to become the safety doc like what what events in your childhood adolescence and maybe young adulthood as you made the decision to move into getting an education or a higher level education getting your phd what were the events that led to you deciding that safety was going to be your expertise so I I replayed my childhood, and there really wasn't a significant um, catastrophic or sentinel event um, which uh, put me on this course to safety. So I had a, a pretty typical childhood, although um, once I was in high school, I had leadership roles. I had keys to our brand new indoor swim center. I was coaching basketball. Um, middle school basketball. So I had keys to the different gyms. So I always had leadership type roles. And leadership, I think, is synonymous with school safety, being a school safety expert. Uh, I moved into the the college uh, world, and, and that's when I became trained as a firefighter. I took courses. I had an interest for a long time in firefighting. My grandfather was a fire chief, back in the 1940s and and would tell you know these these awesome stories so it intrigued me and i was a student of firefighting like i i got every magazine i read all of the books i knew backdraft you know all of these these different um you know terms and in the science and it just it, it was enthralling to me and learning the systems instant command system how you communicate between different locations. And, and back then, I mean, it was still um, pretty basic. You didn't have the GPS, the Garmin systems that all of the fire trucks have today. And the communication systems only went so far. Um, but that was, that was really my first um, taste into being a, a responder or being somebody who's contributing to the safety community. And then it followed me into my first few jobs. I worked at a medical center uh, worked at schools, and, and I seem to always be the default person of, well, David knows safety, so David will do our presentations on um, our evacuation drills, fire drills, um, uh, things, things of that nature. And it was, a, it was a perfect fit. It was very natural for me to give those presentations. So, And how long were you a firefighter? Or I was a firefighter um, for about... Uh, about five years. Five years. Wow. Okay. And yeah, I um, and, and the reason I stopped just was because we were moving, um, you know, my wife and I, and then also looking at, you know, starting a family and things like that. So there were there were just some competing uh, things that, that went with that. I loved it when I did it, mm -hmm. and it, it provided me invaluable uh, information um, and, and insight as I work now as a safety uh, professional. I can go back. It was funny in October 
my youngest daughter and I went to the open house at the fire department and they had their brand new engine mm-hmm. and they were showing it. And, and I said to her, you know, back in the day, the dad fought fires, like we didn't have all of the nifty pre hooked, you know, hose couplings and, and the lights to tell you how much water was in the tank. You know, you had somebody look down and, <laughs> and, and, and with a flashlight or a, put a stick in, you know, and yeah. here's how much is left. I said, so, uh, you know, it was a little different back then, um, and the, just how, how much the technology has emerged. But, uh, and this but, was when in the uh, early 90s? Early 90s, yeah. yeah okay. Early, early 90s. So, yeah, a lot of your apparatus, you know, would have been made in the 1970s. So, um, and I love the show Emergency, the TV show Emergency from the 70s. I mm-hmm. binge watched that once in college an entire weekend, like all of the episodes. So, but yeah, I, I, I felt a strong interest as, um, as I moved into school administration, my role coupled with school safety as a director of student services, it's a, it's a pretty natural fit. Mm-hmm. And then also my responsibility to was, was to ensure the safety of students with disabilities. So you have to think if you're evacuating a school for any reason, um, how do you make sure that students with disabilities uh, can safely participate in that? If they have medications, how are the medications making it out of the building um, to the evacuation site? So then, you know, I, I really started to increase my awareness of school safety, seeking out more training. Um, it, it just became, it, it kind of became who I was. It was the default of David is David is the safety guy, and, and I embraced that. So that went, you know, well into the early, um, you know, 2000s for me. Mm-hmm. And so you seem like a very analytical person, especially throughout the episodes, the 100 plus episodes that you have now. So uh, just to jump back a little bit into the the firefighter piece, did you find that you were looking into like fire science and things like that? Like, you know, how how, uh, what fuels a fire and things like that? You seem like the kind of guy that would kind of logically break down all the different pieces of what a fire would be and then kind of learn about that. I did, and and I actually would always score the top in my class uh, with that because I I remember we we had a training and it was about arson. So they they set up a burn site, and I went back to it uh, later, and I just um, went through everything to to make sure that I fully understood the burn pattern, and it even came down to like needles on an adjacent pine tree of looking which way the needles would shift. Uh, due to heat and then, you know, to kind of give you a direction of where the, the fire source had started. But I subscribed to every magazine, uh, firefighter magazine that there was, and I would go through every article. And this was before the Internet. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're really getting your, your information from there. But that and then just understanding the apparatus and what everything was used for and just talking and listening to people who had done this for years and and soaking all of that in. But, yeah, very um, very analytical. I would study fire hydrants. And I, even to this day, as I go through town or different communities, I mean, I know how much water pressure you can bring out of a hydrant that's red versus green versus yellow. And in Wisconsin winters, if you bring, um, in my hometown in 1989, we had a huge fire downtown, uh, the biggest one ever in the community mm-hmm. and multiple fire departments responded, but, um, they ran, uh, they almost ran dry with the water tower. So it's the middle of winter and there's a river nearby. You'd have to go down to the river and start cutting through and running water up from the river. So I'm trying to figure out as that was going on too, you know, this, I, this was when I had an interest before I was a firefighter of how many trucks they'd have to pump this water up to the location. And, um, you know, people don't understand too, you can in in Wisconsin, if you pump too much water out of a water main, it can break, it can collapse, especially like I live in the second oldest community in the state. Mm-hmm. So, um, it, yeah, it is. It's very analytical, being able to quickly size things up. And people have said I've had a good skill for that. And actually, I, I do think any safety situation I can analyze rapidly and make a determination on a best course of action. So I think that's a gift that that I have. So do you think so in your childhood, I think you had mentioned that you were kind of an in-between kid. You, you were not completely raised in the city and not completely raised on, on a farm. You're kind of in-between or you saw kind of the both best of both worlds. 
can you explain a little bit about how maybe that allowed you to analyze different situations even while you were growing up? Absolutely. So I was fortunate that I was a kid that still had the 30 mile roaming range uh, from home. And, you know, now we know that kids have a, a one mile range on average or about 300 yards in any direction. And that's kind of it. So in my community, which was small, you know, about 1200 people, we had a river. So my friends and I could go down fishing. We could go through the woods um, and didn't have cell phones. So you, you just did that. And, and how you told time was either by watch or you knew that they had the noon siren, the fire siren, and, and you calibrate it by that. Mm -hmm. But we also had a farm. And my family was into farming ginseng, which is a, it's a specialty. Um, it's a root that's sold uh, overseas. But um, I got I learned how to drive tractors. So, you know, at 10 years old, I'm driving different tractors and heavy machinery. So in that environment, you have to be extremely aware um, of what is happening around you and not um, only the people around you. But if if the you know, the the roads kind of get muddy and you have the tractor that, you know, just for your personal safety. So it's a lot of responsibility. Um, so being able to to combine that with also, you know, the city, um, well, not city, but I mean, a small community safety, uh, I, th I think really gave me that reconnaissance aspect mm -hmm. Um which and I could get on my bike too, and we had a, a, a train track that went through town. And with my friends, uh, sometimes you, if you follow the train track, of course, it'd take you to the next town. So we could we could go out for a day, you know, and walk the eight or nine miles to the next town over, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then hang out a little bit, and then just follow the tracks back. Um, but I attribute a, a lot of my childhood to having a very good reconnaissance um, experience in, mm -hmm. in different environments. Um, and we know that exploration is a type of safety exercise. So as I'm going and we have a swinging bridge that goes across the river is, is you're you're always assessing kind of your risk on these because they all have risk and no one is supervising you. But um, those those experiences, which we're losing today, I mean, I don't know if we're losing. I think we've lost with uh, with children um, helped me to hone my situational awareness skills. Yeah, I think um, as a parent, I constantly struggle with allowing my girls to explore, you know, beyond <laughs> my comfort zone. Uh, and even though that's still a very, very small comfort zone that I have. And when I was a kid, you know, we would travel, like you said, you know, eight, 10 miles a day back and forth, you know, to the different areas of the city. And, you know, we'd be back before sundown and everything was good and get up the next day and. <laughs> on to it and nowadays it seems so scary to, to allow our kids to do that and, and the world is different I, I don't know if it's different in that we're more aware of things that are going on or you know there's just more bad people in it but but you're right it, the exploration of our kids is significantly di diminished their situational awareness because they're not able to do that reconnaissance like we used to do when we were younger yeah. And, and I talked about that in my uh, PBS presentation of just how important reconnaissance is. And if we can restore that to school safety, we we've done a lot, but no one is, is going there. We're just getting smaller and smaller in that Rome zone. So let's take it then. So you, you mentioned uh, briefly that you became a school administrator. So was this before or after or during the time that you went to college? I guess your bachelor degree years. Yeah, so um, I went to college and I had a bachelor's degree in communicative disorders and a master's degree in speech language and uh, practiced as a speech language pathologist in a medical center for a few years and then went to the schools for a few years and then uh, became a school administrator in 2002 and held a school administrative role till 2014 when I accepted a fellowship at UW-Madison to go full-time into my PhD and study high-stakes um, decision-making in military healthcare and education. And then after that, things uh, changed because I, I really took on the consultant role because I was being asked to consult in districts, expert um, witness work for legal firms. And that's where life kind of took me and teaching more at the post-secondary level. I've, I've been a professor um, 
since 2013, have instructed over 100 courses in school, superintendent legal issues, super, um, or special education, law, inclusion, things like that. So, um, so yeah, I, I had that. But I also worked at the Wisconsin School for the Blind, um, and and this was recent. I mean, I, I just retired. Um, so that experience was about four and a half years. And talk about sharpening um, your ability to identify accessible systems for safety. How do you teach safety to someone who's blind and has autism? Right. Uh, but you do. Like you can teach, you know, intruder drills and fire drills and things like that. So once I was able to interface too with that population, um, both adults and um, students, it allowed me to see um, how first most systems aren't accessible and how to also make them accessible. And if I could make them accessible there, I could probably make them accessible anywhere to anybody. And that was a huge plus professionally for me um, to have that opportunity to work with people who were blind. Yeah. And so you mentioned uh, that you got your master's in speech language. Yeah, I did. And then I went back and uh, got another master's degree in superior in um, educational uh, administration. So as well. Okay. I, yeah. and so I want to maybe go into the, the speech language. And you were working as a speech language pathologist there for a while. Is that right? I was. Yeah, about four years between uh, medical sector and then schools. Yeah. So for the people that don't know kind of what a speech language pathologist is, can you just kind of quickly explain what that is? And, and, and I'm going somewhere with that. So I just want to want people okay. to know kind of what we're talking about with SLP. So on the, me on the medical side, um, a speech language pathologist will typically work um, with either articulation, which is sound production, um, or else uh, cognitive, you know, work with memory, work with swallowing, dysphagia. Um, and then also in, th wow, we have a little rumbling. <laughs> it's it's barely audible over here, so it's fine. We All right, can keep good. going. Okay. <laughs> um, right. So speech language in the medical sector will yeah, work on articulation, work on cognition if somebody's had a, a stroke. Mm -hmm. um, or traumatic brain, brain injury, and also swallowing. Those are the big three areas. In schools, it's mostly articulation and language, expressive language. So the words that you're using to communicate, receptive language, the words that you're understanding. Um, so yeah, both of those settings that I, I, I had worked in, and I enjoyed you know both, but the school community, then you're also part of so many different school activities that are going on. And I, I really enjoyed you know working with the different professionals. And so you worked with uh, school age kids as well as adults when you were doing uh, SLP, the speech language yeah, pathologist. Yeah, um, I you know worked with people um, who were 100 years old and and you know uh, children who just turned age three. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Because uh, this is kind of you know, this is just me kind of putting pieces of the puzzle together for you know how someone becomes a safety expert or you know who becomes the safety doc. So if you look at your choice, your career choice there, or at least your scholastic choice there, uh, you're looking at communication, which is, which is one of the fundamental principles of, of safety, right? You have to be able to communicate kind of rules and principles and things like that. And then during a crisis, communication is key, right? As you've mentioned in your book. And, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But it's interesting that you chose a profession that deconstructs how we communicate, you know, in, in speech language pathologies, right. you're breaking down, you know, how they're pronouncing the enunciation, the, the, if they have barriers to getting the words out or constructing the words in a way that people can't interpret them and make sense of them, you actually help them get unstuck through those pieces. So, I mean, if you think about it, you're really de deconstructing the ability to communicate and then trying to help that person reconstruct a way to do that. So I, I don't know if you were aware of that or, or if that was a conscious decision for you to kind of move into that realm. I, I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, I did think about it in the linguistics mm -hmm. way. Um, James Fitzgerald of the FBI used linguistics to determine that Ted Kaczynski was the Unabomber. So he studied um, the, the different 
samples of writing that he had. And linguistics is very closely associated with speech language. Right. Um, so, but yeah, I, I hadn't thought about it with the with deconstructing, and I believe, you know, that that's an accurate assessment. And yeah. then also the the fundamental um, need to make sure that your message is being uh, clearly communicated and then understood and that you have a check for understanding. Right. And, and that's actually a big part of what I do when I work with um, school districts as a consultant is to work on the induction process or make sure that people understand when they come into a district what the expectations are for school safety and that they demonstrate that. They can say that back to me and they can they can use an app or use a reporting device. Yeah, and it's it's really interesting that you chose that area to study because you're dealing with the mechanics of speech, right? The physical mechanics of speech and allowing a person to overcome those physical limitations, but also you're working with the uh, psychological piece of it, the uh, interpreting and understanding of it, like you mentioned with the strokes and things like that. So it's really a full circle, uh, in my mind, a deep dive into how communication flows from the mechanics of speaking to the interpretation of what has been spoken so you know i'm i'm, I'm really i didn't i didn't know that about you that's surprising to me so oh. I'm, I'm glad that we're able to bring this to the audience that you know i think that's one of the fundamental pieces that that you had in your life in the education that really contributed to becoming who you are today and then subsequently writing the book and i think the way the book is written now it makes perfect sense to me how how clear it was and concise it was uh, for me reading that book. So, uh, you know, that makes a lot of sense for me. So I just well, wanted thanks. to highlight that. Thanks. Okay, so uh, so you uh, got your, ma your two masters, and then uh, one of them was in speech language pathology, and one of them, or speech language, and the other one was in a school administration, correct? Yes. Yeah. And at that time, then you became a school administrator, or yes. during that time, right? Yes. And then uh, the school that you were working for allowed you to work on your PhD during that yes. time. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They were they were very accommodating. And then also um, I did, you know, completely separate out from working as a school administrator. So I could I could take advantage of the fellowship and have two years. That, that's that's all I was doing is studying every day. Um, so it wasn't something on the side. It was just that was my my life when I picked up my Ph.D. or in my Ph.D. out of Madison. And we also knew um, as a family then um, that I probably wouldn't be returning to school administration because after I, I obtained the Ph.D., it was either going to be a university role or to expand out the consulting that I was doing. So, um, yeah. But, yeah, for two years, though, it was it was full time, you know, uh, up in the morning and just in, in books and research and meeting with people and, and phone conferences. And um, and I'm glad that I did that. I, I'm, I'm glad that I chose that route, even though it was a, a little nervous at the time, because you never know how the landscape changes in school safety. And you're giving up an administrative position to fully devote your time into becoming an expert into something else. But it worked out really well. So what is the technical focus term that, that you did your Ph.D. on? What is the, the focus? Um, high stakes decision making um, in um, military education and school settings. So really looking what, what are the what are the components that um, are involved in high stakes decision making? And one is like your own personal uh, bias and use of discretion. So. In, um, for example, looking at the work of Steve Kastner, uh, who works with NASA and Top Gun. So Top Gun pilots, how much discretion do they have um, to I interpret or override practices versus like staying strictly to the, the practices? Um, and in schools, it was amazing because discretion was significantly different building to building, even within the same district. I wrote about how as I, I was going to districts, I went to one elementary school and every classroom there was a baseball bat near the door. And I said, well, tell me about that. And they're like, that's in case somebody comes in. That's our intruder baseball bat. And I'm like, well, why, do, why aren't they at the other schools then? And, and it was site-based management, which what m most schools are. So the superintendent, you know, everyone could interpret and protect their schools as they saw fit as long as it adhered to policy and there wasn't anything saying you couldn't use a bat. 
But we know like those types of things really aren't realistic, but that's what that school administrator, that principal thought needed to be done to right. keep that school environment safe. So, um, yeah, I was, I was fortunate. Dr. Paul Rapp headed military medicine. Um, I remember watching him uh, on a, a chaos special on Nova. Uh, this was probably around 1990. Mm-hmm. And it was fascinating because um, I'll never forget, he had, he had images on the screen of heartbeats. And one was a, a heartbeat where it was basically um, the heartbeat was, was replicated one after another. So you could just overlay and it would be the same. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then the other image was, was all kind of jittery lines, you know, with the, with the heartbeat. And, and he said, so looking at these two images, if I was asked you, you know, the, the viewer, which one is normal, what would you say? And the, the consensus was, you know, well, the one that looks like it's replicating in the same pattern would be, be normal, right? Consistent one. Yeah. That's a, that's a healthy heartbeat. He said, no, 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 no. That's like somebody about to go into a seizure or who is suffering like extreme, like duress actually for your heart to have this pattern, this more erratic pattern. This is normal. This is completely typical. Um, and so he helped me. So that was a bridge into, he's an expert on chaos theory Mm -hmm. and chaos of course comes in with school safety um, situations, and he helped me understand chaos theory. Then also, we be, we became friends, and I would um, talk to him. You know, we'd set up uh, Skype calls, and I would transcribe everything that he that he would say, and then I would analyze it and make sure that I understood it. I was reading through his materials. He was sending me articles, um, terminology in in the book, such as simulate annealing, mm-hmm. and people would say, "Oh my goodness, like what does that mean?" And and is this really a technical book? And it's like um, simulated annealing. I thought the same thing when Paul um, shared it with me. I said, I, I don't understand what that means. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, let me tell you, it's, it's, um, here's, here's an analogy you can use in your book. It's, it's a hiker who gets on a mountain and they get halfway up and they, they get disoriented. They don't know where they are. So they have a choice. Um, they can either you know, stay there and probably nothing is going to happen or they can go back down, which is injecting noise, or they can go up, which is injecting noise. So he said, this is simulated annealing. This is getting yourself to a different state of, of chaos. Mm-hmm. So he said, you know, but there's risk involved. So if you if you go up the mountain, maybe you've expended more calories and you realize I'm just higher up and there's nothing that I can see that helps me out. But there's also potential reward. Maybe you get up and you can see, oh, there's a village down there. So like now I know where to go. Mm-hmm. So he would help me bring the, the terminology to a level where um, I could grasp it and I could relate it then through the book to the readers to understand. And that's fascinating too, because like, you know, just people don't think of safety in those, those realms. So I had the time again to, to go and find the people who were the leaders in the field and schedule appointments and and read through the materials and have notes ahead of time for them. That's very important for me. If I was going to do it, I would do it. I was going to do it right. You know, to become an expert, I wasn't going to have this as a side, um, uh, cert, not, not certification, but kind of a side degree. You know, right. people go back to school and and admire people for doing that. But I need it if I was going to really be what I wanted to be. It was kind of like you know the national leader or one of the national leaders in this. This was the route that I needed to take, and family was very supportive of that too. So let's go back to then that decision that you dec- that you made to go after a PhD because that's not a decision that. <laughs> you know, you can just make on a whim, right? Because right. there's a lot of work invested in that. And then there's also some PhD programs that don't allow you to do work or to work while you're doing the PhD program. So can you can you just talk us through how you made that decision with your family and what are the things that you took into consideration before taking the leap going into the PhD program? Right. So I... Um, I knew I wanted to attend UW Madison. They were ranked number one in the world in educational leadership and policy analysis. So I would be working with the people who are writing the textbooks for everybody else. And um, so, but with that, as as you indicated, um, there are significant sacrifices because the the time commitment and the accuracy of what you do is held to a very high threshold, which I'm glad. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually had to, <laughs> I 
I pledged and was accepted to a frat at like age, I don't know, 40 to get <laughs> into UW, Matt, as one of my things, because you had to show that you were involved in this sure. community yes. and, and, in, and in the university community. And I'm like, I'm, I'm 40. Like, what do I? Um, so I found this and it was funny because the frats uh, person said, um, well, I'm not saying no, but like, we've never had someone your age apply right. before. It was an academic frat, and and so I kind of explained the situation, and and it did work out. But it was funny. It was right. that part, and I'm like, I get it, like I get it, but I don't know how else. And I I would I didn't really do much with the with the the frat, but mm-hmm. um, but yeah, UW Madison, um, yeah, to make that decision, it was clearly go big or go home, mm-hmm. and I wanted to to go where and that and that's something today. No one asked me for a resume. Um, they, they, they don't, I mean, once you come out of Madison, once you've been on public TV and some of these things, they know you. And that was, that, that, that's just, um, it, the, the credibility I knew coming out of that. So yeah, as a family, we knew that it was, it was a leap of faith. I knew I was, was talented. I knew it would put in the time, but it was also, uh, it was very challenging because writing a dissertation it is significantly different than being a school administrator when you're writing more or less concise things with bullet points to get out to people. So as I started to write the dissertation, which was maybe about 160 pages, now my book is 204, totally different styles, but um, I had never written in that style before. Right. And I struggled with it. And I knew it was a good writer because I had been published in a number of journals. I have numerous articles um, out there. And um, suddenly I was just, it wasn't happening. And I remember, um, I, I mean, I had the content, I had everything down, but then to put it in the, this, this format of, of a research paper of, of this magnitude. And I remember my advisor saying, you know, maybe you should check out the writing lab. And I'm thinking the writing lab, <laughs> PhD like I have, two, student. <laughs> I have two masters and I'm going for a PhD and, yeah. and I've written and, and, and it was really a humbling and, um, you know, I come, I came home and I went out for like a run that night and I was just like gritting my teeth. I'm like writing lab. You gotta be kidding. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I went to the, to the writing lab and you sucked I, it up and you went to the writing lab. I did. <laughs> and, and I remember I walked across campus. So UW Madison, 43,000 students. And it was, it was a night in January and um, there was a snowstorm, and, and the, there was snow just whipping past me, and there's nobody else out. Like I'm walking across campus, and it was this moment of just solitude, and and just like should I should I do this or not? Like should I really? And I got in and in, into the writing lab, and the person who was I had set this appointment up with, they were wonderful. Like just said, yeah, this isn't uncommon. So like, mm-hmm. um, it's a different way of writing. So started to show me here's how you set this up and some transitions. And then it started to click, like I started to have it. And, um, but again, that was, that was a tough point because you have to take your ego and step it back because I, 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 that was, that was hard to hear. Um, and so I did the dissertation and actually when I did the dissertation defense, um, I, (laughs) this is, this is a fascinating story. (laughs) So you can bring somebody with you. And my priest came along with me. Now, he's a good friend, but he uh, also – so and he brings in – typically for a dissertation, so you have four or five professors in the room. And then you are, you are giving your presentation of your findings after like two years of intense research. And um, they either pass it or they don't. So, you know, he my, – my priest is there some thinking – he's a good guy plus like – so I've got – I've got the spiritual angle working for me, the good energy in this room. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and within, you know, 10 minutes, like, um, they shut my presentation down and they said, nope, like this, um, you, you know, we're, we'll, we'll let you know what, what you have to change. And, and that was it. And that was supposed to be like a two hour process. And I was just stunned. I, I was just completely stunned. And, and I said to, to my friend, um, you know, the priest who was there, I said, I, afterwards, I'm like, I didn't think you'd have to administer the last rites to me. I didn't expect to come in here and get, get pummeled. I mean, and what I did is I, I, I made two mistakes, mm-hmm. learning mistakes. One is, 
um, there had been a school shooting the day before, and I decided I was going to incorporate that into my presentation to kind of give examples mm -hmm. to make it real. Like this is, and that was a mistake because it wasn't part of the study. It really had no place being in there. And the second one was, um, I didn't go deep enough into theories. Like I really wrote well about what I was doing, but I didn't get into the theories. And I remember meeting with my advisor afterwards and he said, cause he, he, he thought it would, it would go much better than it did. But I was glad actually that it went the way that it did. Mm -hmm. Um, because he met afterwards and he said, well, the committee was also thinking you could just call some of these people who are ex experts in the field of, of situational awareness, um, in distributed learning. I mean, they're out there, they're at universities. So just get a hold of them, tell them what you're doing. And instead of quoting them in a paper from five years ago, like get them on the phone and quote them right now with some of your stuff. And I did that. Like I tracked these people down and they were more than willing to share information and give some reflection. And then I came back. And, and it went smooth. Then it was all together and I understood. And that's something that's, I'm glad it went that way because now when I do research and as I, as I became an expert witness, I know to anchor everything down into um, the existing, existing data, multiple data points research, and also get on the phone and call these people. I mean, you think they're unreachable. Right. Um, Danny Woodburn wrote the foreword for my book. And right. Danny... Woodburn is, for people that don't know, uh, one, he, he's, he's a, tr a tremendous actor. He played Mickey Abbott in Seinfeld. People might remember him from there and so many, mm -hmm. um, you know, other, other media appearances. But he's also an advocate for people with disabilities and spends the, you know, splits his time between those two, um, you know, aspects. So he, I mean, he became a friend of mine at, at a conference and we built up a friendship and it, it was also where... I could speak and kind of bounce ideas off of him. Mm -hmm. He's done, you know, much for inclusion. We talked about with disabilities, accessibility. He sees it from a different world in Hollywood, but he's also seeing some of the same things. Like, yeah, I remember like casting calls where, you know, there weren't any elevators. You might be on a second floor of a building and things like this and right. accessibility and also being excluded from things. And in the book, the theme, uh, one of the themes too, is if you have a disability or special need, you could be excluded from safety uh, to some to some level. So Danny and I had a, a good partnership that built and it was all, you know, to, you know, you get to know someone and then you know them on a first name basis. You can call them. And um, but I had I have so many people that I can just pick up the phone and call. And before I went to UW Madison, I would have only learned about these people through their research. Like I would have followed them or read their articles and. You don't realize they're actual people. And it's 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 funny we're talking about this. Somebody um, saw my latest PBS presentation, which, mm -hmm. you know, was, and and they sent me an email on a weekend and said they're from Florida and said, um, is, is there any way I can talk to you? Because I, I do some school safety in a district down here. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, and I actually said, I've got time like right now. Mm -hmm. Like you can call me now or whatever. And like, here's the number. So a person calls and the first thing they said is, I can't believe like I'm actually talking with you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe this. Like I've seen your stuff. I've seen. Yeah, I, I'm just like. So we had this, you know, kind of minute and I'm like. I'm, and then I realized I was that was that was me, you know, a while ago. Sure. And by me sharing with this person because they, they were talking about how they wanted to introduce learning objectives into their district. I was passing forward what had been passed forward to me by the generosity of Dr. Paul Rapp, mm -hmm. uh, Steve Kastner, you know, NASA Top Gun, um, and, and so many people who contributed into my books and into my podcast, James Sibley, Bart, Barta, things like that. So, um, so I realized, yeah, at that moment it was, um, it, it, I had become what other people had become to me in helping me elevate to this level in school safety. Really amazing, really amazing story. Yeah, and so just to kind of wrap up this segment here, uh, just so people know, so what was your thesis for your dissertation? What, what what was it that you were defending? So, so the actual thesis um, was comparing um, elementary schools and multiple school districts in Wisconsin on how the principals determined um, how school safety would be interpreted and implemented in their settings. So when I talk about, you know, military healthcare, 
in education, that was strong in the lit review. Mm-hmm. So I spent a lot of time there. But the actual thesis was comparing how administrators use discretion. Um, and yeah, what key, what what factors into that bias, experience on the job? Um, was there any tendency if you were a male versus a female? Um, you know, if it was a, a large urban district versus rural, rural and things like that. So, um, and were you required to postulate a hypothesis or no? I was, and I uh, the hypothesis was that in a larger um, district. So one was in a larger district. This uh, that school safety would be much more formalized, and principals would you'd have inter-rater reliability. So mm-hmm. uh, if you have eight elementary schools, each principal would largely be, be doing the same thing. And then um, also the longer that you were on the job, um, that you would be more closely adhered to the the policy. That you wouldn't be um, introducing a lot of your own discretion on interpreting it. And actually, both of those were false. Like they didn't prove, <laughs> they didn't prove out. Um, what actually happened was, if you, the principals, um, it didn't matter if they were in an urban district or rural. If they were very different one from another on how they interpreted policy and experience um, didn't play into it either. If you had been there, um, you know, fifteen years versus had you had you been there two years, it seemed they were more. They knew what they could what their bounds were with the superintendent and superintendents change every two to three years. So basically the principals I learned were just, if they lasted longer than that, they would just recalibrate to the threshold of the new superintendent. If the superintendent would allow them to exercise a lot of discretion, they would go for it. The superintendent was very strict. Then they would just, you know, they would always kind of just align to what the superintendent was. But, but yeah, some, I mean, amazing people, but the range of interpretation, um, and I also, I, and this was, this was also honing my skills for expert legal witness work, which came after that, where mm-hmm. I could start to analyze and say, well, here is a principal who exercised way too much discretion and didn't document anything, mm-hmm. just kind of handled something. You know, a student made a threat, so brought them in and talked to them, but no record of talking to them, what they talked about, communication with the part, uh, parent. So. Um, so that all of these things, as you kind of indicated in my past, um, morphed me to, to really, when I took on that expert witness role to be super efficient at it beyond, I mean, even the attorneys would say, you're just so good at this. (laughs) Right. And, and that seems to be the final piece of the puzzle, just looking at, you know, from your early childhood to now, and then, you know, your academic career as well as your professional career, kind of just wraps it all together. And, you know, in the next segment here, when we get back, we're going to talk about kind of what your qualifications are as your expertise now, you know, being launched off of the PhD. Um, And then we'll get into a little bit of the discussion about the book. So we'll be back in a few minutes. A must read for parents, teachers, and taxpayers. Dr. David Perodin has written the most honest book about the $3 billion school safety industrial complex. Attorney James Sibley proclaims, a brave demonstration of speaking truth to power, School of Errors rips the lid off the billion dollar school safety industry. Using real world examples of successful responses in desperate situations, David contrasts the expensive window dressings pitched to panic parents with the inexpensive and effective approaches proven to actually work. Read this book before you let your school waste another precious dollar on meaningless safety theater. Buy the international bestseller, School of Errors, Rethinking School Safety in America, now at Barnes & Noble or Amazon. So let's go, let's give the audience... um A little bit of background about your expertise. You know, we walked them through kind of your childhood, adolescence, um, the beginning of your school career, uh, your education, your academic career. And now you've obtained obtained your Ph.D. And so once you've obtained your Ph.D., I'm sure you started getting calls for, you know, taking advantage of your expertise and and some of the things that you've done. Um, outside of your your school admi- school administration career and outside of your academic career, what are some of the other things that you've done 
you know, to help in this area? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the PhD, definitely the credential set and being out of UW Madison um, is recognized. And, and, but when I, it was uh, May 22nd, 2013. So it was while I was in the midst of, of obtaining my PhD, um, I did a presentation on public television, schools, um, school security in America and, and safety preparedness. Um, and I did that following the December 2012 uh, Sandy Hook school massacre. And I had approached PBS and said, I am studying this as part of my PhD program, and you don't have a presentation on your um, website and your programming that has to do with school safety. And I think I could deliver that for you. And also rhetoric free. So it would be empirical, meaning it's facts, it's research, and that I could get into that. And so so that's totally, totally where I was. Um, I, I gave this presentation May 22nd, 2013. It's still around. I mean, and people watch it. It gets put in the programming um, typically after Sentinel um, school safety events and different, you know, PBS affiliates. But it was coupling my PhD to that that really gave the credentials of, okay, this this guy has his PhD in school safety generally. Well, I mean, high stakes decision making by focus on schools. There isn't a place you can go to get a PhD in school safety. It's not a right. degree. Um, but then also I had been on PBS. So then I had kind of these two things that came together. So like, okay. And at that point, the lawyers um, who were looking for expert witnesses in a student wrongful death case, um, they would go and, 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 and they started to find out who I was. I mean, just through, and I had, um, uh, you know, articles I had written, the PB, PBS presentation, the PhD, mm-hmm. and do a little research and say, hey, you know, it, would you consider being an expert witness in this case? And I actually joined um, an organization that now serves um, to, to be the, the kind of the broker for me. I mean, they, they filter out, they have, I make people go through this third party organization and then they vet them and make sure, um, because otherwise I, I just don't know if, you know, when you get these requests, you need to make sure that you have a reputable attorney that you're working with and right. things like that. So, so I started to get a lot of requests and the first time I received a request, um, the, the law firm, Eventually, we, we were discussing some points of the case, and they sit, they send you a summary. It's it's typical. It's like three or four pages. They take the entire case and boil it down, and you have to make sure you don't have any um, conflicted interests. And that's why I never did anything in Wisconsin, because I just knew too many people here. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I do other states. And at the end, they said, well, how much do you charge? And I thought, I have no idea. I've <laughs> never done this before. I have no framework. Right. I'm like, I wasn't planning on getting into the expert witness world. Um, it just kind of knocked on my door. So I quickly changed the narrative and said, well, you know, I need to analyze everything case by case and the nuances of the case and and just provide me the information. Mm-hmm. Give me 48 hours, I'll get back to you. So of course, <laughs> I'm contacting every lawyer that I know, you know, that I've worked with in sure. special education for the years and said, help me out with this. And, and, and they gave me some frameworks and said, here's typically what is charged and, and here's how you want to structure. So then I had a very nice document that I created and, and provide it back to this law firm. Um, and things went really well. So how that works too, is you're paid a retainer and it's a non-refundable retainer. So once they would bring me on board, if the case would settle or get dropped or something, um, two days later, I still got the, to keep the retainer. Right. And then you, you always, you, once the retainer would be gone, you would ask for another like five hours and they would have to pay me in advance and you work up to five hours. So it's one of, it's a misconception too. People always think when you're an expert witness that you get a, a cut of the final settlement and that's not accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is, it's extremely lucrative, though, if you are um, able to look at the inside of school operations and policies and procedures and how they're implemented and how new staff get trained on things. Right. Um, and then also to um, understand the kind of the, the 
safety side of things, obviously, like how instant command system work and mm-hmm. wor- works and police and fire and all that. So I, I kind of I, I knew all of that, especially knew the school side really good. Mm-hmm. So um, I could also th- this actually happened with one of the, the law firms working with me. So they'll ask one. Do you think this is a case that our approach um, and, and we would have different Skype meetings and things like that. Do you, do you think the approach is appropriate that we're taking? And I'd be be honest and say, you know, either yes or no, or here's how I'd change it. And sometimes if they, they didn't like what I said, then, okay, fine, here's your, <laughs> we'll pay you out and we'll go somebody else. Right. And I was always ethical about it too. Sure. Um, but we would, we would go through and I, I remember one time it was, um, it was a larger district and it was a wrongful death. And the, School handbook, one of my arguments was that the school handbook um, wasn't, didn't cover um, student safety and th- harm to self, harm to others, or, you know, like a suicide risk. Mm-hmm. And so, but this was more of a hearsay that the attorney was bringing forward to me. So I said, well, we need to get one of these. So can you put it, um, so that they can do what's called a deposit. Now I had to learn all these terms too, right? Sure. So I have to take like, legal terms. you know. I have to I have to go intense on on law on my own to to figure this out of you know what's a deposition and mm. what what is a Bates numbering system like every single document I literally have seventeen thousand pages in one court case in a room next to me um, right now um, that have been mailed to me and everyone has its own number on it so as I'm writing my expert witness report I can go back and reference each document and then also reference like each line has its own line so it might be you know, document 123, page 17, line four. So wow. like, whoa. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so I, th- so going back this, this handbook, um, the district wouldn't provide the handbook to the attorney. And I said, there's something wrong with that. Like every district has its handbook, obviously in electronic format, or they have extras because kids move in. It's not like, you know, the first right. day of the school year, here's our kids for the year. We have nobody right. else coming in. And so I'm like, there's something that that's a red flag. So I said, put an ad in the paper. If they're not going to give it to you, put an ad in the paper and say, um, we want the handbooks from these years and do like two years before this event, two years after the event. And we'll see um, also what had changed in the handbooks, if anything changed. And that was it worked. I mean, it was fascinating the work around with the district. And also, I think that deteriorated in the judge's eyes the integrity of the the district that the district wasn't willing to do that that this was a reasonable request for the district but they were stalling their legal was buying time so i said something's wrong and i did find things definitely in the handbook Mm -hmm. to indicate that they had a change in procedure but also a change in procedure that wasn't linked to policy so after this um, wrongful death happened that things changed but they didn't necessarily change the policy and so i mean it, it was it was all these things i mean for me to look it, it was right there in front of me because I had done this for so long. And I'd say, when had people been, when had people been trained and asked for the records and who attended the training and the materials and stuff like that? So I, I, and the more I did it, just the better I got at it. And um, having to write those reports, um, I had no problem, even though it might be a 130 page report. And also for an expert witness, I didn't know this, but it's, so you're basically working with your attorney. Um, so I would, I only work for plaintiffs, which mm-hmm. was an interesting position too, because I'd been a school guy right. and I wasn't representing the schools. I was representing the people going after the schools. Right. Um, uh, you know, so yeah, putting, putting that different, um, position, but you know, just, wow. I mean, as, as you know, an, an expert witness, um, like I said, getting getting to see the how how uh, especially turnover. You know, people weren't trained in school safety, right? And and the safety procedures, or it would just be like, hey, you know, read the handbook or or you know, read the policy, and it's like, well, that's passive, and no one's going to do that. And the policies maybe haven't been updated. So, yeah. but so um, you took what you learned from being an expert witness and getting access to some of these documents from other school districts around the country. Right. Uh, that helped you kind of refine your focus on, you know, and, and calibrate how um, the document should be created for a school system, especially the one you were working in, right? It did. And, and I, I was doing a dual role because I do that. And I'd also serve as a school consultant for um, some districts and also for some government agencies. So I could say, 
right now in the field, this is what's happening. And I'm teaching, you know, also at a university level to administrators and saying, this is what I'm seeing right now. So this is what you need to prepare for. And, and I'm going to help you with that. So I also had a foot in both camps. So I, I, I knew what was happening or I could even run things past my university students saying, you know, would you do, let me put this as a scenario, of course, you know, not that it would be closely tied to anything that could be identified to a legal case, but, um, and get feedback from them. What, what are you considering in making this decision? So, yeah, um, all of those things came together, uh, really to, to improve me as an expert witness, improve me as a consultant and as a university instructor. So mm -hmm. kind of iron sharpens iron. I had that mm -hmm. happening in my career. Everything was just sparks. It was just crazy. Right. So that all brings us to the decision to write a book. Right? Yeah. School yeah. of Errors, which is why we're here today. So School let's of... let's uh let's go into the take us to the moment when School of Errors became a possibility in your mind. Absolutely. So um, I was contacted by a, a an editor from a publishing house, well, pu Roman and Littlefield, my publisher. Mm -hmm. And um, I had written an article for School uh, Business Affairs International. Uh, I have written many articles on school safety. I don't know what the, the core of this article was, but um, it happened that the editor for the magazine knew the editor for the publishing house and said, you know, this this could this guy could write a book on this, and there really isn't anything out there. And people keep asking us, you know, as a magazine, a professional organization, do more on school safety. So um, he contacts me from the publishing house and said, "Have you ever thought about writing a book?" And I said, "No, not really. Um, I haven't." And said, "Well, here's what we would need," and which was intense. Took me a few months. It was like a 16-page proposal, and you had to read books that would be similar in the field, how your your book would be different, who it would appeal to, um, why people would want to read a book that you wrote, what was so special about you. Mm -hmm. So I put that together and submitted it, and um, and they loved it. They said, yeah, go ahead and, and write this. Um, so the I, I dove into it. like I was just writing like crazy. And what I was doing, though, I was writing a lot from my own experience as first person kind of it and mm -hmm. initially i submitted it and they said yeah this is this is interesting but it's like a memoir mm -hmm. we need you to to step back and to um you know include maybe more interviews with people or you know for example you should only be using first person at the beginning of the book in the preface and then at the end in the epilogue and the rest mm -hmm. of the book should all be third person mm -hmm. so um and i that was hard for me because I'm a very anecdotal person. I tell things through stories. Right. So I had to tell things through people's stories that, mm -hmm. and that actually I think brought a lot more richness to the book. And so as I'm going through, I'm, I'm reformulating the, you know, how, how I'm going to get this information. So I'm reaching out to like a drone expert who's my neighbor to mm -hmm. Two blocks away, commercial drone. This is what he does. He works with power companies. So he goes up and then he gets video footage so they can inspect like their windmills or their turbines and stuff. And um, so I said, I have a section here where we're going to talk about like drones in the book. And so can you also like, we'll make a podcast out of it for one. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, he took me out, showed me how the drones work and then search and rescue with a drone. How does that work if you're doing like a student with autism wanders from a school? So I could actually get to see these things, could interview him as a certified commercial drone operator. I, I got to meet Katie uh, Pashan out of Cajun Navy Relief. Katie was in her, her 20s and had, had become a dispatcher for Cajun Na Navy Relief, which is, um, you know, largely a group with pickup trucks pulling all kinds of boats um, mm -hmm. And they're, they're going into flooded areas in Texas was one, you know, the Houston, general Houston area after the Hurricane Irma Harvey. And she's telling me how these communication systems work, like using the app Zello, all of the things that I want to write about in the book. Um, so this is just amazing for me to get this information from, you know, her and um, talking with uh, Kevin Sullivan, who was an Iraqi war vet. Kevin was on a tarmac and all of a sudden, uh, bombing started. And he, he gave this brilliant account of what it was like. He said, at first, I thought somebody was backing into a dumpster. 
And then I thought, oh my goodness, like I'm in Iraq, we're being bombed. Should I, should I pull out my gun? Well, what am I, what can I do? Uh, where do I need to go? Like I need to go back to my plane, but what are we going to do? We can't go down the runway. And so he just runs through this whole series of chaos. So I, I was getting great information from people. Like they were, they were sharing this, Dr. Paul Rapp and, um, I, Paul Varian, who who've been in communications for like 40 years, done communications at Super Bowl, stuff like this. So had all this information coming in and then I needed to figure out how to put it together. And I worked with, um, also Ann Sturzinger and Ann Sturzinger is an author and, um, she helped me, um, keep, uh, assemble all of this in a very long longitudinal pattern. She, part of what I was afraid of doing was writing something that was like right now. So people would be relevant right. for like this year, next year, then it's like old news. Right. And, um, you know, with Anne's writing, you know, being an author and, and an editor, she goes all the way back and was saying, well, you know, really look at social contract theory and let, let's, let's take this back to, you know, four or 500 years of looking at what safety and just, you know, look like back then and we'll, we'll bring it up and then it's, you know, be relevant. And the other part, too, was everybody that writes in school safety writes in a friendly, positive, uplifting manner. Mm -hmm. And I was I wanted to have a little bit of a black pill or a, a bit of a biting sarcasm to the book, because um, th when I was writing the book, I feel there's a lot of things that are wrong in the industry because the industry has become um, filled with marketers and vendors. And, and people not taking the time to do their research. So we have a $3 billion fortification industry, all these things that are being sold, window films, bulletproof igloo, stuff like that to schools and saying, this, this is getting way away from what really makes schools safe. And the fact that I, I, I'm going to call people out on this. I'm going to call out the industry and say, it's going in the wrong direction. Um, but that's a dangerous move because once you write a book like that, and take that position, you'll you'll have some people in your camp. And I, I know there's a lot of people that believe that, but they won't say anything. And my superintendents at the time that I was teaching, you know, they're finishing up their degrees, they said, yeah, I could never say anything like this because I'd lose my job. It's a district of 300 kids. Mm -hmm. It's a small community. If I'm not on board with using, you know, safety grant dollars to get fencing instead of improving our two-way radios, yeah, I mean, people can see fencing. They're not going to see the, the radio. So mm -hmm. I... So I was I, I went out on a limb, I mean, to write this and to take this position of saying, hey, what we're doing is, is crazy and all, we can't fortify our way to safety. Here's, here's an article about a, a teenager uh, who climbed the World Trade Center while it was you know, being built, went up to the top. And how does that happen? I mean, how does but every day like things like this happen? Yeah. So, yeah, I so and definitely kept um, kept the edginess because every time I, I we, we kind of met in the middle because she would go very edgy. I would kind of be at the, the, this more accommodating, soft position mm -hmm. um, of, of of friendliness, and and we kept it so it, it does have this biting as as you read it. I mean, it, it definitely it's informative, has a lot of anecdotes, but it goes right after, for example, the professional educator standards. Um, and you know, thirty pages, ten pages are just they, it starts out here. Here are all the people that contributed to this document, mm -hmm. and I'm like, that's that's embarrassing that's a shame i mean because it's all lofty language and it doesn't help you at all with safety and i went through it there wasn't anything about safety and it was a third draft since like columbine mm -hmm. how do you not have safety in your professional educator standards which then the universities are supposed to calibrate to when they put their programs together right. so i just i called them out i mean it was very direct and but i i had some motivation for that there was a book um, by lawrence cutner grand theft childhood that mm -hmm. came out after um, people thought video games were the cause of, of students being violent and things yep. like that. So Lawrence Kuttner with Harvard, and I forget who, who co-wrote with him, but wrote Grand Theft Childhood and said, no, the research does not support this. Um, and and put, pretty much put an end to that dialogue. People were, were no longer being called in to testify before Congress about their video games. And if we think about it, Hector, I mean, I'm in Wisconsin. When I grew up, People in my high school actually had, you know, rifles and shotguns on their gun rack in their pickup truck. You know, that was a thing. Like in Wayne's World, remember the gun yeah. rack that mm -hmm. Wayne got? Like that was common. Yes. Like every place you went. And and we have a deer hunting, you know, it's a hunting state, deer hunting and stuff like that. But I mean, it didn't mean because that that was translating into my classmates 
being um, at a higher risk to bring harm to their school or others. So cut Lawrence Kuttner's book really, um, I, I said, well, if he can do it, maybe I can do this with sure. School of Errors. Like maybe I can turn the tide and make people realize, hey, we spend, you know, 80, 80% of every dollar on fortification devices, window films, uh, bollards that, you know, those, those kind of tusk type things that go into sidewalks in front of schools and stuff like that and security guards, whatever. But we spend very little on threat detection. We spend a fraction of, of 1%, less than 1% on research. Mm -hmm. So like, let's turn this around. Mm -hmm. So I, I write about this and also like, it wasn't a solution book. I knew right away, like there, I'm, I'm going to educate people and bring them into perspectives they'd never been before. Like looking at through simulated annealing through chaos theory, through transference dynamic. Um, one of the things Paul Rapp said to me as I put this book together, he said, Dave, when you look at the Harbor Rescue in New York, 500,000 people in nine hours on September 11, 2001 were rescued. Biggest um, naval or, or biggest, biggest water rescue ever. Mm -hmm. Most of those boats were tugboats, the majority, and, and you know, sightseeing boats and just civilian boats. A handful, you know, between fire police and things like that, but they had never practiced before. Like, how did the system come together? Organizational theorists would say, you could never do this. Like, you could never swap out, make a vehicle from a Ford motor, a Mercedes suspension, you know, and, you know, a chassis of a Nissan. Like, this would never work. They weren't designed together. This can't work. And yet, like, that totally worked. That's exactly what happened. But it also happened because the people grew up in, they were, average age was 40, and this is where I worked with New York City Department of Planning. I contacted them and Paul said, you really need to study the people because that's the story here. Mm -hmm. So so I get in with New York City of Planning and they, I go online. And of course, I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be horrible, like horrible to complete this paperwork. Like just because I know from the legal side to get anything like how intense that was. And but yeah, and just, you know, working you're thinking a big city, a lot and, of bureaucracy. And this was getting access to some information about 9-11? Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I, I approached um, the Department of Planning and I said, I, I need these documents. And also, like, I had images that I had found online and they were credited back to the city. But I said, I don't know where these were sourced out of, if they were part of an article or presentation. So they assigned me. So I put in this request and then they said, um, we'll get back to you within, I don't know, like three weeks. But within like a week, they got back to me. And there was one person assigned to me. Her name was Yvette. And uh, she was incredible. And, you know, the whole purpose of the book, they have to to understand why they're working with you. And then they send you like a legal agreement that you're, you know, getting information for the book and the research. Provided me everything that I needed. And... Yvette would track down this one image and literally I'm out with my family on a Friday night and we're grocery shopping. It's eight o'clock. Okay. It's eight o'clock and my phone rings and I'm like, okay. So, you know, I'm answering it and it's Yvette. And she said, I found the image. I found the lower Manhattan image. It is in this document from whatever, whatever in this, like I have it in a JPEG, like high resolution. I'll send it to you. And then um, I'll get like a letter to go with it from our law, you know, folks of saying that you have permission to use it. I'm like, oh, my God. That's wow. Amazing. Like, thank you so much. But they I mean, everybody was so I think I, I, there was almost this vesting like they they really were genuine about wanting to help me and wanting to make sure that I had the right information. So unbelievable experience there and, and i go back and and i start looking at the at the population so you know average person age 40 worked in um finance you know the, the typical the majority of the people rescued from lower manhattan so paul uh, dr rapp said well look at, look at the u.s from 1980 to 85 when these people are growing up like their formative years what was happening because that's how we perceive things down the road the transference dynamic how you're raised is, is how you perceive things. Mm. Um, so uh, a couple things. One is, um, and this was amazing. So this is in, in, in the book in, in quite a bit of detail, you know, much more detail than we'll get into. Very fascinating to read this, though. Um, so 1980 to 85, um, and, you know, kind of my generation, too, as I, as I was growing up. But we had uh, Ronald Reagan as president. So very much portraying the Soviet Union as the enemies, 
And and this was on CNN all the time. We had the Strategic Defense Initiative, which was Star Wars, where you could have um, satellites use laser beams to shoot missiles out of the sky. We had the launch of the space shuttle, our first space shuttle. Um, the Soviets had their only space shuttle, um, and it it was um, Rocky IV was in theaters. Mm-hmm. So you know Rocky against Drago, mm-hmm. the protagonist of Western values versus the antagonist. Songs sting. Um, I hope the Russians love their children too. Nina, ninety nine red balloons, about NATO. Um, encroachment and things like that. So it was thick. Like everybody growing up believed that the Soviets were the enemies. But by doing that, they believed the government would protect them. Right. And the, if there was a disaster, the government is here to protect us. And that was just what you're taught. So 9-11, those same people now, fast forward years later, they're down there at Battery Park. And as they see these boats come in, they're thinking, this is a government rescue. The government is, we are, you know, we are raised, the government is going to protect us. They're going to save us, and we need to trust the government. That was not a government rescue. Mm -hmm. The only part of that that was government was Admiral Loy of the Coast Guard Guard gave a command saying over Maritime Radio, anybody with a boat, come down and help uh, the best that you can. And that was it. No directions, you know, no flow charts, nothing like that. Systems developed. But people, because they saw that kind of pareidolia, like you look at the moon and it's like, are those faces? Is that cheese and stuff like that? Yeah. They they manifested this rescue system just as much as the people kind of just figured out in the moment what to do. Like this boat goes here, this boat slides over here. We'll use a bed sheet. We'll write Hoboken on it to know where we're going. We're going to rip this door off and use it as, as a gangplank to get people in. And it just worked. But it was because the people also expected this force to be there. And, you know, the, you go back to things like um, Ro- Robert's cave experiment, you know, if that would have gone on much more than nine hours, yeah, maybe you would have people start deteriorating and fighting each other in line, like trying to get to the front. But everyone was kind of moving forward. And so it's this whole psychology. Talk about it. And then I fast forward to right now and say, it's different, though, today. Like, would, if we had a 9-11 type event or some sentinel event that involved a lot of students, how would they respond? And it's amazing because they'd go to their phone. We know that's the way that rescues are done. Um, we talked about I talked about Katie Pachan and Cajun Navy mm-hmm. um, in the hurricanes. People were going to, you know, 2017, they're going to Facebook Messenger and they're asking, I need help. My house is flooding. Mm-hmm. And they're not calling 911 because they can't get through or the local fire department has one boat. So they can't really do anything in this community. You know, three to 5,000 is being flooded out. So you go to Facebook Messenger. Katie receives this on the other end, um, 300 miles away. And then she knows where the boaters are with Cajun Navy Relief. Um, she's tracking them on, on some mapping software. She uses this app, Zello, which was based out of Houston, still is, had 14 people at the time. Mm-hmm. And she's it's a walkie-talkie app. And then boaters have this. And she's able to say, hey, like this person just messaged me. Here's where they're located. And the they're saying their entire house is surrounded and needs someone to come get them. And that happened independent of FEMA, independent of, of local governments. So you also had, had this entire network of rescue that developed this whole system developed that wasn't based on conventional thinking. Like we wouldn't think that you do this. Um, so that's also where schools have to have this, this deep look of how do you in interface with, um, agencies which might be civilian rescue forces because i think we're going to see more of that and we, we're so focused on intruders too what if there's a tornado what if there's a blackout what if there's a solar flare that takes out some of the satellites on electrical i mean we've got to be able to think on our feet for all of these things or flash floods hit your community and so that's where the book gets in with with so many stories to kind of bring this out and one of the things too is when, once you get done with with the book um, I think it equips you for understanding yourself. And I'll say that because there's something in there called Taurus theory, T-O-R-U-S. Taurus theory um, states, and, and I'm pretty liberal with my interpretation of it, but Taurus theory states basically that um, every day is similar to the past. We can kind of expect that, that you know, we get up and pour a bowl of cereal and drive to work and, and you're going to have fluctuations, you know, traffic be a little different, stuff like that, but it's kind of similar. That's your Taurus. That's what you get used to. And you have to recognize though, when you're exiting your Taurus and going into chaos. So on nine 11, um, that was definitely a moment of, of chaos. You know, 
for me, I was in a car accident in January, um, a serious car accident. I, know, I realized the moment that was unfolding, I was going to go from my Taurus into chaos. Um, and then, um, so if you can recognize that you're going into chaos, you can just psychologically handle it a lot better. There are many studies that, that just say, if you tell people ahead of time what to probably expect, like this is, this is what would happen if there's an intruder, a tornado, if we lose power, if there's a lockdown for an extended amount of time, this is what you're probably going to expect. People handle that really well. Mm-hmm. But if if you don't take that step in school safety, it, it it's hard because people are in chaos and it's uncomfortable. They don't they don't realize they're in in chaos. They don't know how to process through it, like simulated annealing, like I like I said with the mountain. Simulated mm-hmm. annealing on 9-11 is I might take this boat to get off of lower Manhattan to get to Hoboken, but I don't live in Hoboken. I live 50 miles away. But from if I get to Hoboken, Maybe someone can give me a ride to this point or I can take a bus or I can get a hold of someone that can meet me at whatever. Right. So all these little ways. And, and we do this if our airline gets tra- canceled. So right. you get canceled and then, okay, I, I can get on a Greyhound bus or I can take like some connecting flight. So it's it's this, but um, but yeah, people aren't aware of, of this this uh, space between their, their Taurus and chaos. And I think that's where reconnaissance, when I was growing up, you understood when you approach that much more readily. Um, and, and I'm arguing strongly in the book that we return to that. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that did jump out at me is how you uh, interplay situ- situational awareness and the techniques learned through becoming situational, situationally aware and how when you're in a moment of chaos, how that skill of being situational, situational aware uh, really helps the calm factor, right? So if you can kind of stabilize yourself in that chaos, be comfortable in that chaos as best as you can be, then you can start formulating decisions to try to get yourself out of that situation or at least protect you from whatever's going on as best you can. Yeah, you're you're right on, Hector, because um, once you recognize you're in chaos, then you can start to function in chaos. But mm-hmm. when people don't recognize they're in chaos, they try to return to the Taurus. Right. And a way a way to describe this is, uh, uh, you know, 100 years ago, movie theaters, um, movie, a number of movie theater fires. So um, people watching the movie, a fire would break out. They would they would try to go out the same way that they came in, you know, through the lobby and all of that. And um, but there might be doors at their left and right that they could have just gone out and people try to go to self similar, what they're aware of instead of thinking, okay, this is chaos. What is the shortest way out? It's like, no, what was the same way that I came in to get out? So it said that part. And again, you know, I've personally been there. Um, if you can recognize that you're entering chaos and once you're in chaos and then, and stabilize yourself to a new Taurus or your new normal, I guess, um, as fast as you can, it really is is psychologically healing and, and empowering to do that. Right. It can be liberating once you're in Taurus. As Paul Rapp said, um, Chesty Polar, um, I believe, received many um, military awards in his career. But he's quoted as saying, well, we're surrounded. That makes things easier. Hmm. And, you know, is is kind of true. I mean, once you get into highly chaotic situations, it can simplify things out. Sure. But this isn't the way that schools work, though, right? Because schools will give you a three-ring binder, and they'll try to have you memorize. If there is an intruder, you have to do these 17 steps right. and things like that. So you get you force people to be linear, when in chaos, you need to be very nonlinear and very fluid in perceiving your environment, your situational awareness, and what's changing second by second, and what's available to me as best options. And we're taking that away from people when we do what we're doing right now of, of scripting all of this stuff out is right. really a bad, it's a bad way to do things. And, and that, I think that's compounded by the fact that as parents, that safe radius has shrunk down so much. So uh, you kind of mentioned in the book that the kids are not naturally getting into some of those chaotic events through their exploration. Uh, because as parents, we're trying to minimize, I think, as parents, we're trying to keep them in that Taurus 100% of the time as much as possible because that's what we know and that's the safety ring around their, you know, the radius around them. Um, and, you know, when you and I were growing up and we explored the boundaries, we, we constantly pushed the boundaries and 
it was almost in a sense trying to find that chaotic event because we were just keep pushing and keep pushing. And in certain situations, we found ourselves in chaotic events and that allowed us to kind of adapt to those situations. But now as parents, especially me as a parent, and I speak for myself, but I'm sure others are in the same boat is, you know, we try to put the, put this protective cloak around our kids and when a situation happens where they're going to be thrown into a chaos, it's it's almost to the opposite end of what they're being, what they are in their Taurus, and they cannot stabilize or get comfortable right. in that situation. And so that compounded with the fact that schools are trying to create this cookie cutter way of this is how you handle this type of event. And I think you mentioned in your book also, like for tornado drills, you know, we don't go and create fans and you know throw debris everywhere to simulate a tornado we basically have to adapt to the situation uh you give general guidelines general rules and then you know you follow these general guidelines and rules but in some cases you're going to have to you know go away from those uh but in for the school shooter and you know i've done some of those in in the awareness podcast and just looking at how you know the planning or the lack of planning has gone into that you know even recently for some of the schools you know we're not teaching them you know to be adaptive in that way and um you know in some cases utilize technology to be adaptive but like you mentioned if technology goes away which happened in 9 11 the the cell phone system kind of you know got inundated with calls and it kind of basically shut down but yet people from our generation which was mostly our generation if not older you know they figured out a way to get out of that uh safely because it was 500,000 people in nine hours. You know, it is by far the largest boat evacuation in history. Second or the second one coming in was Dunkirk, I believe, right, right in World War II. Yes. Um, and that was 339-ish thousand people. And that was done over like nine days or something like yeah. that. Yeah. And so, you know, that and and to my understanding, there was nobody hurt in 9-11 in the evacuation process, or there were very little incidents of report right. and no deaths, which in my mind, in that type of situation, we're under attack. You know, there could have been stampedes, you know, people, you know, pushing each other to get onto these boats to get off the island um, because of the panic that was happening at that time. But instead, you see pictures of people helping, helping el- elderly folk, you know, giving them the right of way before right. them and and things like that and that leads to your transference dynamic that you were talking about so uh you know i think it's a compounding piece of or it's a how do i explain this there's a lot of different areas and how society has changed that's leading to the the harm that we could potentially be putting our kids in into the school systems with the school systems trying to enact these certain policies and procedures that may not be in line with, you know, how parents are uh, allowing their kids to develop in this new world. Yeah. And I, I agree with everything that you, that you said, Hector, and, and something that has, uh, you know, come on the scene with schools um, are these virtual reality field trips. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when we talk about transference dynamic, um, you know, there are districts now who are saying you can't go to D.C. or New York or any of these places because uh, or not districts, but, you know, parents are saying we don't want our eighth grader to go there. It's too dangerous. So we'll swap out the virtual reality field trip in the gymnasium. Well, a couple problems with that. One is um, you you now are conveying the message to your child. The world is dangerous and we can't safely equip you even with adult chaperones during daytime in these you know, sites which have been, you know, interface with tourists and, and kids for years. Like we can't even, we can't do that. We can't keep you safe. So you're, this is the transference that they're getting. World is, is dangerous. Um, I've got to, to limit my own reconnaissance um, as much as possible and stay very close to my, my Taurus and my Rome zone. Um, the other part is, it's positionality, right? So if um, someone is hired, if they've hired Carol to do the DC virtual reality trip, maybe she's been there one time and you're just getting this experience from Carol instead of 40 kids going and getting this unique experience on their own or little groups of kids or they go off and do something, um, you know, in in one area they branch off and, and just in stuff that people that are interacting with that day, things that they're seeing, stuff that they can touch, feel. It's all gone. And in 
instead of, of perceiving your environment, you're getting a perception of the environment from someone else imposed upon you. So um, it, th- these are some horrible things. And it's it's a part of, again, the safety industry is, is preying upon this because you could say a virtual f- reality field trip would cost less than going to D.C. Like if you live in Wisconsin, you could and it'd be true. Like it would you wouldn't have to pay for uh, transportation, lodging stuff. But that's not how they market it. They said it's all about safety. We can keep you safer. So yeah, we we are we are sending this message that da- the world is dangerous. Don't do reconnaissance. Don't even touch with that outside of your Taurus where chaos might exist. And we will we will keep you safe. So what that looks like down the road when we actually do have a Sentinel event, I I don't know. So as we wrap up, Doc, a couple questions as we bring this episode to a close who's the target audience for the book one is um i I think it has general appeal to everybody but if you're a parent obviously you need to read this book because uh you need to understand the the deterioration of the rome zone of reconnaissance of what that is doing to your child and it's probably you won't realize it until you're reading through this and and start to benchmark back to your own life and say, yeah, like when I was growing up, I was able to do these things or my, my grandparents and stuff like that. And, um, you know, certainly educators, because with educators, it is the one book where they can hold it up when they're alone in their room and say, thank you. I'm not alone. Like book, you and I are aligned together. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is I, I find this a lot. And I found this after I presented on public television. Uh, people would came up to me from the audience afterwards and said, I, I feel exactly the same way that that we we've you know kind of gone over the top with hyper realistic drills and some of these other things in school safety and want to bring back sensibility and more situational awareness. How do I do it? And I'm like, the book will help you understand the narratives of how to introduce things. Just like you said, why would you do an, an intruder drill? It might be hyper or, or a tornado drill with. Um, you know, putting pellets or gravel into a fan to, to make it realistic. Well, you wouldn't. Like you, you would talk about how to do this and, and practice it. Um, and it's this whole thing of learning objectives, introducing learning objectives. So I'm really into that. Um, but yeah, that's that's the takeaway. You know, it's going to be parents. And we have 55 million students attending school every day. So that's a huge group of parents. And also parents need to the questions. Um, if my child's in a portable building, we have thousands of those virtually no regulations. It's the lowest bidder. Um, so they don't have the same security systems. If they're preschool community sites in my own district right here, I, I spoke with the superintendent a few weeks ago as they're elevating their safety. And that's an area they're focusing in, um, how to make sure that they're informing their community preschool sites. If there is, a, you know, some type of emergency at a district that all of the buildings are aware of it. Um, so these these are things that people just don't think. Of. What about online classes? Students taking courses all online or part online, half in the school. Well, what if they miss the day that you have your intruder or fire drills because those are days they're home? So helping people, uh, parents think about that, educators think about that, and I think taxpayers have a vested interest in this because we cannot sustain a system where we're spending three billion. I argue it could be up to five billion a year, and it's escalating on things that just aren't making us safer. We have the same frequency of shooting and we still have Parkland, Santa Fe, uh, STEM shooting, these type of things are happening. So um, it's not effective. So if we're, it's gonna to get, to po- get to be a point where you're going to really start to erode the money going into academic uh, areas of education for, fortif- and it's gonna be going to fortification instead. Meaning the kids aren't just, they're not gonna receive the level of, you know, reading, mathematics, language arts, all that that they should. And that's happening. I mean, districts are having to make that choice. So it's it's that whole call, but, you know, to, to everybody for awareness. But again, if, if people have read the book, I've read the book, and I, I, I'm always, I read it cover to cover. I, I, I'm excited when I read it. I think it helps every single person that reads it um, understand, again, that self-similarity and also be skeptical and the right questions to ask about what's happening in my environment, any safe, any situation that I'm in, whether I'm in a workplace, you know, or whether, yeah, I, I'm with my kids at some activity or they have some school safety drills 
what are some questions that I can ask? And if you're a parent with a student with a disability, so we have about 8 million students um, in the U US, you need to read this book um, because there is a trend right now for students with disabilities to be exempted from safety drills. And um, I have an article that will be in CAP in a Phi Delta Cap and Journal, they're featuring this. An article I wrote later this, this year will be in one of the um, issues. Um, I talked with attorney James Sibley. He was on my podcast. But this is this is happening. Parents will call me and say they had a drill today, an intruder drill, and my child, my child with autism came home and I didn't he didn't say anything about it. We got a notice from the school said, Hey, we're just doing a follow-up email to everybody. There was an intruder drill today, so if your child has any questions. So they go to their child. This actually happened, and parents um, went to their child and said, tell me about the drill. And child said, um, what? I just went into the library, I watched a movie, and nothing else happened at school today. So they approached the school and said, you have to include my child in safety drills. I mean, what if anything happened, or also lifelong, what if he's 22, 25, and something happens? He needs to be able to understand if a fire alarm sounds or understand who to ask for help or things, you know, interacting with police. So, yeah, I, I think this becomes an automatic resource for parents of students with disabilities to be aware of this trend and also to give them the language to use with their school to open up those discussions. And last question, Doc. Where did the name School of Errors come okay. from? Let's let's get that question answered. Yeah, it, it actually came from Sean Dickers. Dr. Sean Dickers um, it, it was one of my member checks for the book. And I, Lessons of Lower Manhattan was the original title, uh, working title, right up until the end. And the publisher said, the thing with Lessons of Lower Manhattan, it's, it's too regional, right? It's Manhattan. So if someone's in California or Florida, and it kind of sounds a little bit like a novel, right? Lessons mm -hmm. of Lower Manhattan. So um, we want you to, to, to come up with some different titles. So they had some titles that they put forward. And I went to some of my member checks and said, I need some ideas for titles. Because at that time, I just need the book to get done, right? Mm -hmm. Because this is a long process. And I'm like, title? Um, so School of Airs, Sean Dickers said, well, this is, why not this? It's a playoff of Shakespeare's Comedy of Airs, which Comedy of Airs talks about people who know better but are, are making ridiculous decisions and and it is it has you know this comedic feel to it and he's like you know this is kind of we know better in school safety and we're still making these crazy decisions so school of errors rethinking school safety in america so um had that and put it forward in the publisher they ran it by some test markets and said, yep this this is great like this people um will will, will identify this and and also it plays really well off of kind of that that second step with shakespeare and yeah, so that's how that's how School of Errors uh, came to be. It's supposed to be Lessons of Lower Manhattan, and there still is uh, there are a few threads in there where you can see the strong ties mm -hmm. um, of Manhattan because there's so much influence of of nine eleven in Lower Manhattan, you know, throughout the book. And with that, we'll close. Uh, Doc, thanks again for allowing me to do this with you, and uh, good luck on the book. And anybody listening, uh, as a parent, I've learned so many things from reading just the draft that uh, the doc sent me. And I, there were not just lessons about school safety and safety in general, but also lessons that you can take, you know, in your personal lives as a parent. And so, get the book. It's it should be out now. And where can they get the book, Doc? Sure. Of course, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, uh, Target, and, you know, Roman.com is my publisher. But it, it won't be hard at all, you know, to find the book through any of your traditional uh, sites. Uh, this is a book that's it's nonfiction. It's received a lot of attention from libraries, and it also has strong international sales, um, which just means that, you know, I, I think it's it, you're going to see this in, in also a lot of your local libraries and um, universities are, are picking up this book, too. So, um, yeah, but you'll have no problem. Amazon or, or Barnes & Noble, your place of choice, uh, you'll, you'll be able to get it. And as always, the show notes should have the links to the books. So go there for a quick and easy way to get access to those books. Thanks again, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Hector. This has been the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio show host, and leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Remember to check back each week for the latest 
best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. You can find Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe.